Thank you to the American College of Surgeons and the session moderators for the opportunity to discuss management of difficult cholecystitis. I have no financial disclosures. So the first question to assess when looking at a patient with acute cholecystitis is, are they an appropriate candidate for general anesthesia? And although this is a question that all surgeons are familiar with, the Tokyo guidelines actually provide specific recommendations for how to assess that, although they acknowledge this is an ongoing area of research. For our discussion today, we're gonna to have a shared understanding that cholecystectomy when safe is the most definitive management option for a patient with acute cholecystitis. So the Tokyo guidelines make recommendations based on the grade of severity of the acute cholecystitis. And I wanna review that here. That was defined in the 2007 guidelines with severe cholecystitis being accompanied by organ dysfunction of some sort, moderate being accompanied by factors such as an elevated white count greater than 18,000, palpable tender mass, long duration of symptoms, and marked local inflammation on uh, imaging studies. So when you assess whether or not a pa patient's an appropriate candidate for general anesthesia, um, the recommendations vary by grade, whereas a patient with grade one or mild acute cholecystitis is recommended to have a laparoscopic cholecystectomy um, as long as their CCI and ASA score suggest that they can withstand surgery. For moderate acute cholecystitis, it's similar, although the recommendation is to consider an advanced surgical center and have backup options available. And grade three uh, is really where we get into some detailed discussion about organ dysfunction, how the patients um, respond to supportive care, and likely discussions with your anesthesiologist. But the recommendation that if they can withstand surgery and you have a specialist surgeon with extensive experience and the availability of an ICU, that an early laparoscopic cholecystectomy can be performed. The other factor that many surgeons take into consideration in deciding whether or not to proceed with surgery is the patient's level of risk for a bile duct injury. And while this used to be based on the amount of time that the patients had symptoms, that's generally gone out of favor with the most recent Tokyo guidelines suggesting that the optimal timing is early surgery, regardless of how much time has passed. And based on meta-analysis that suggests that when you compare early as defined by less than 72 hours or early defined as less than one week with delayed surgery, there's no difference in bile duct injury. For patients who you assess those two things and decide that they can't go to surgery, either they're not appropriate candidates for general anesthesia or the risk of a bile duct injury is too high, then percutaneous drainage is often the next option considered. Um, drainage with a catheter is recommended for all surgically unfit patients with cholecystitis based on the 2013 guidelines. And although relative contraindications include coagulopathy and ascites, um, because those can be addressed, um, they are actually only relative contraindications. It's important to note that there's uh, a transhepatic and a transperitoneal approach with a transhepatic being more common um, because it provides greater stability, reduces leakage. Um, and although it has some risk of bleeding, pneumothorax and fistula, those are generally pretty low. There can be technical barriers that prevent placement of a percutaneous drain, and the most common one encountered is a shrunken gallbladder tightly packed with gallstones in which there's just no room for a drain to be placed. The percutaneous transhepatic gallbladder drain is the standard drainage method recommended by the Tokyo guidelines, and however, they acknowledge that there are alternative options in high volume institutes when the skills exist. The chocolate trial is often referred to, and so I wanted to take a moment to review this. It was a multi-site uh, randomized controlled trial where they enrolled high-risk patients and randomized them to either uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy or percutaneous catheter drainage. Um, the trial was actually stopped because of the high rate of major complications. And I think it's important to note here that the definition of major complications was really quite wide um, and included things such as recurrent cholecystitis, but that the risk of having emergency surgical intervention and in someone who had a percutaneous strain was 3%. Um, and that is the complication that most of us are going to be worried about if we're choosing to manage a patient non-operatively. And so I think that's um, a reasonable risk to talk to a patient about who really is high risk for general anesthesia.
If the patient can't get surgery and they don't have a drain placed, then most commonly this is going to be the scenario with a contracted gallbladder or someone who's awaiting correction of a coagulopathy, antibiotics can be started. And in what's now a rather dated paper, there was a randomized control trial of pretty high risk patients. So an Apache 2 greater than or equal to 12, and patients were randomized to antibiotics only or percutaneous cholecystostomy. It's important to note that in this study, the drains were placed transperitoneally. Um, and they identified that all patients who were successfully treated with antibiotics showed clinical improvement during the first three days of treatment. I think very reasonably they summarized that percutaneous cholecystostomy didn't decrease mortality um, in their study, but um, that it might be suggested for patients who don't clinically improve. And that's consistent with what we see in a pooled analysis here, which is that um, conservative treatment in this case defined as non-interventional, so they didn't get a percutaneous drain and they didn't get a surgery, um, has a success rate upwards of 80%. Um, and a recurrence rate that is notable to be high in the 20% range. So while non-interventional management of acute cholecystitis can be successful in the short term, it certainly is not definitive management in the long term, and that should be addressed by the surgeon and the patient. So to summarize, if patients couldn't get a surgery and can't get a drain or are waiting on being appropriate for a drain, we go back to the Tokyo guidelines and identify that for patients with mild acute cholecystitis, in fact, antibiotics and general supportive care can be the recommended treatment for those who are high risk for surgery but have mild disease. For moderate disease, antibiotics and supportive care are recommended for high risk surgery in whom that's successful. If those management strategies aren't successful, then drainage um, would be the alternative option. And finally, in the patients with severe acute cholecystitis, because of the organ system dysfunction, some sort of source control um, is recommended. And that can either be an early laparoscopic cholecystectomy in an advanced center or urgent drainage um, in a patient who is too high risk for um, surgical intervention. We're gonna go back now to the patient who we assessed and decided was a reasonable candidate for surgery. And we're in the operating room and um, we're encountering difficult intraoperative anatomy. There are multiple um, ways to address this. Um, two of the most common ones being an intraoperative cholangiogram versus ICG. Um, obviously an ICG requires appropriate resources in terms of uh, the scope as well as anticipation of the need for it and giving it prior uh, to surgery. In um, a systematic review, looking at the failure rates of intraoperative cholangiogram and ICG, how often they technically just can't be done, the failure rate of um, intraoperative cholangiogram is higher than ICG, and that's an important factor uh, to consider as you decide how you might address anatomy in a case where you anticipated that that would be what you would encounter. If with those tricks, um, anatomy is unable to be identified, there's a really great um, conceptual roadmap for avoiding bile duct injury. The first is to get the critical view of safety when that's possible. Um, but the second really is this inflection point, this moment where you recognize that you're not able to get the critical view and it's time to step back and assess your bailout procedures. The operative conditions that lead to inflection as defined here are not finding the gallbladder, very uncommon. Only the dome can be identified, also uncommon. Or what's more commonly, where the hepatocystic triangle can be reached, but the critical view of safety is not attained. And the two options here are reconstituting versus fenestrating. There's an excellent course available uh, to everyone, um, the safe cholecystectomy modules uh, through SAGES. And if you're in surgery and you meet that inflection point, the reconstituting versus fenestrating are both available options for doing a subtotal cholecystectomy. The reconstituting um, has a gallbladder essentially recreated, but a smaller one by closing the remnant um, and has the risk of having new gallstones formed there and requiring subsequent intervention. The fenestrating, while it may lead to a biliary fistula that could require additional procedures such as an ERCP or sphincterotomy, um, doesn't have that risk of recurrent disease the way a reconstituting does. And many surgeons um, 
we'll address this patient by leaving in a drain and monitoring for bile in that drain. Um, if no bile is there, then the cystic duct is probably permanently occluded, and that would be the end of that patient's management. If bile appears in the drain, particularly after they eat, um, then an ERCP with a sphincterotomy can often help um, resolve that bile leak. Two components that have um, traditionally impacted the decision but probably are uh, less impactful in the current day are patient obesity. There are many tricks and tools um, described for this uh, patient who may have difficult intraoperative anatomy and anticoagulation, which can often be medically reversed. It's important to note that in COVID, um, ongoing discussions about the best management of acute cholecystitis are happening and that the risk of 30-day mortality in patients who have COVID who undergo general anesthesia is much higher. And although this is not specific to uh, cholecy cholecystectomy, many centers, including ours, have avoided surgical intervention in these patients and opted for either antibiotics or percutaneous strain to avoid the postoperative pulmonary complications um, associated with the combination of COVID and general anesthesia. So in summary, uh, First, assess whether the patient's an appropriate candidate for general anesthesia. Um, if they are, assess the severity, whether or not you're um, equipped to uh, address their surgery based on that at your center. And no matter where you are, if it's technically challenging, uh, consider a subtotal cholecystectomy with fenestrated being the most popular option. If they're not a candidate for surgery, assess whether or not it can be drained. Um, if drainage would be high risk, um, and if it would, you might trial antibiotics before uh, taking on that risk of placing the drain, and often you can optimize the patient in that intervening time. Thank you so much, uh, and look forward to the rest of the talks in this session.